I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. David Carrier, a professor in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Utah. He has a BA in Biology and Geology and an MA in Biology from the University of Utah, a PhD in Biology from the University of Michigan, and specialization in the evolutionary morphology of tetrapods and musculoskeletal biomechanics. Dr. Carrier's research includes the evolution and functional morphology of hominins, the biomechanics and evolution of lung ventilation and locomotion, the ontogeny of the vertebrate musculoskeletal system and locomotor performance, as well as the anatomical and physiological specialization for aggressive behavior. In other words, Dr. Carrier is an expert in how we evolved to hunt and how we adapted to fight, which is our focus today. So David, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me, sir. Uh, Tim, thanks very much for including our research in, in your program. It's, it's great to be, be talking to you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's so timely. Now, you've proposed several anatomical adaptations for aggression in human beings. And the first one that I came across, and I've come across this several times in different forums online, was the human hand. So if I understand your work correctly, part of the evolution of the human hand includes changes to make a better fist for punching. Can you tell me about that? Yes, and, and I, I think you've bumped into it because it's it's one of our more controversial suggestions. Um, and, and actually where the idea came from is relevant to this general discussion. I Years ago, decades ago, I was at a meeting in Australia and an old colleague, an old friend of mine, and I were arguing outside the, in, in, in the hallways about the evolution of the forehead of sperm whales, about whether or not the forehead of sperm whales functions as, as a battering ram. And he was, he was upset by that suggestion. And our conversation turned into an argument. It got more and more heated. And at one point, to explain to me, to try to get through to me what, he was, what, what his point was, he waved his fists in my face. And he said, I can hit you in the face with this, but that's not why it evolved. And as he's doing that, I mean, he's, he's literally yelling at this point. And there's a crowd of people standing around us. As he's doing that, I'm starting to get, you know, I'm, I'm already sort of nervous because he's so upset. And I'm, th but I'm thinking, as he's saying, I'm thinking, well, maybe it did evolve for this. And so that's where the, the idea came from. So our hands, we, we talk about the hands of the, of, of humans and the ancestors, the bipedal ape ancestors of humans. Our hands are different from the other great apes, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, and orangutans, in that our, our fingers are, are shorter, the palm of our hand is shorter, but our thumb is, is longer and stronger than what we see in the other apes. And these are, these are the hand proportions of, of, of humans, of the bipedal apes, and they've always been suggested to be associated with manual dexterity. Right, everything humans do, we do with our hands. This is this is our main anatomical tool, and so I don't. We're not arguing that that's not true. These hand proportions do allow great. They allow both a precision grip, which is the other apes can't do, and they allow a power grip that the other apes can't do as well. And so, there's no doubt that's true. What we're suggesting is that there may be something else involved. And that is, these are the hand proportions that allow us to form a clenched fist. The other apes can't do that. And, and so we're arguing that it's a combination of, of two forms of selection. Selection for manual dexterity, but also selection to protect this, you know, for dexterity requires that the fingers be relatively delicate, right, for their pre precision manipulation. You've got to have relatively fragile, delicate, vulnerable fingers. And that the idea is that these are the hand proportions that allow manual dexterity, but they're also the hand proportions that allow us to roll the hand into a clenched fist, which provides protection. And so we've done a series of experiments that actually demonstrate that, that yes, in fact, this, this posture of the hand does protect not only the fingers, but the, the metacarpal bones, which are particularly vulnerable in a, in a fist fight. There's actually force being transferred um, 
from the fingers where the impact occurs down through the thumb, thumb to the wrist, and that unloads the metacarpal bones on, uh, that, uh, of the hand. So that's the basic idea, is, is that our hand proportions, which distinguish us from the other apes, are a combination of, of selection for dexterity and for using that delicate instrument as a weapon in a fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, this is one of those ideas that that it, it's one of those things that you can't unsee or can't unhear kind of a thing. And yeah. what's interesting about that is your research, it's it's almost like it tugs the string and the whole sweater starts to unravel. So there, there there's another adaptation as well, um, an, an anatomical adaptation that helps reinforce the bones in our face to withstand those punches. And I've also read that beards may be evolutionary adaptations to soften blows as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, so, so, um, and it, 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 it's interesting that, that these hand proportions and the parts of the face I'm gonna tell you about, the aspects of the face are, that, um, that are important, appear in the fossil record at the same time that bipedal posture appears. So our, our ape ancestors stood up on two legs, climbed down out of the trees and adopted uh, this habitual bipedal posture pretty much at the same time that our face changed and our hand proportions changed. And the changes in the face in these, these uh, first bipeds, they're called hominins, uh, one that a species that many people are familiar with is Australopithecines, right? Lucy, for example, those, those uh, bipedal apes had our hand proportions. They also had a much more robust facial skeleton than we see in gorillas or chimpanzees or orangutans. And so that robust facial skeleton, again, there's another Another explanation in the, tra the traditional explanation that you find in any anthropology textbook is that it, those, that more robust skeleton is associated with chewing harder, tougher food. And so again, that's probably true at some level, uh, but the other thing it does is the robust facial skeleton protects the primary target. So if you look at modern humans, if you look at the epidemiology of interpersonal violence, the people who show up in emergency rooms at two in the morning on a Friday night or a Saturday night, um, those injuries associated with, with a fight are primarily to the face. And it includes lacerations, it includes uh, all, you know, the type of injuries you associate with, with blunt trauma, but a lot of the injuries are, are actual broken bones. So the bones that modern humans break when they punch each other are the same bones that increased in robusticity with the evolution of the bipedal apes, with the evolution of the hominids. And the other thing that is, that is a, a particularly strong piece of evidence is those are the bones that distinguish the faces of, of modern males and females. So, our face is one of the most dimorphic parts of our bodies, and it's that diff the difference in size and difference in shape of the face is almost entirely due to these bones that break when we punch each other. Well, and, and actually, that was my next, that was the, my next question was, it, and again, this is what I, if I understand this correctly, so you get the, the thickening of the fingers, and you get the robustness of the bones in the face increasing. Uh, these these developmental characteristics are, are a result of testosterone, right? So this is triggered in men as they you know as they enter puberty. That's right. That, the, the, there's the there there are really sort of two critical uh, critical periods during development when males and female. Well, actually, there's more than two. I'm, I'm now I'm thinking about development of the brain. But, but if we're talking about, if we're talking about the body, it is primarily not the sexual organs, but, but the actual face and, 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 and body itself, then it is primarily associated with 
with circulating testosterone during the during the years where we go through puberty. And so that's where you and, and, and this is this is true, not just in our species, but in species, mammalian species in general, these characters associated with male male competition, where males are competing for mating opportunities in mammals in general, uh, those anatomical differences between men and males and females occur at puberty. Before that, they're not there. So think of the lion's mane. That's that's one of the classic examples. Uh, the mane protects male lions when they fight. It's 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 basically a shield. And this is, you know, the argument is where the argument for the beard comes from as well. And both the human beard and the mane of a lion appear when they become as they're becoming sexually mature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, the, the thing, this is why it's like you, it makes so much sense on so many levels, right? Intuitively, because it explains what appears to be natural behavior. And I was trying to think what, you know, what's a natural example of human fighting? It's boys on the playground, right? They get in a fight, they punch each other in the face, they usually end up becoming best friends after they cool down. So I, I looked at that as maybe this is the, the most natural example that, that we can find today of how humans naturally fight without any training or anything like that. Should we view boys being boys, as we call it, as basically just an evolutionary drive for children to practice the skills that our ancestors needed as adults? Um, I would say, yes, it's natural. And again, you know, it's not just humans. So yeah. if you look across mammalian species, if you look at the other great apes, the other primates, Males participate in more rough and tumble play. Males play fight in, in, in most species of mammals. It's not just us. And so it is natural. Uh, and the question is, what do we do with that? And um, I personally don't want to discourage play of any form, but, but we need to, but when it comes to to real fighting, which you start to see, right, in uh, in, in 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 teenagers, young young boys, um, at that point, you know, socialization in our species has a tremendous effect on the way people uh, deal with conflict, the way people deal with 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 uh, with problems, and so, uh, I mean, I the example you give. I think is a good one to show what's happened in the past 50 years. So I'm 66. And uh, when I was in junior high school and high school, physical fights were very common. And as you say, they weren't, they, people tended not to, to adults didn't really interfere that much. But um, that happened now there is right now, now adults do, our, our whole system is, is set up to to stop that type of violence and uh it's it's pretty much disappeared it does not happen at the frequency it did when i was a kid that's yeah a that's a good thing it, it i think it is a good thing i think it is a good thing that's our better nature right and yes. you know one of one of the other things that you've talked about is our our ability for empathy and compassion in right. men and women we are not just fighting machines we are right. much more complete rich right. human beings than that but, you know, it, when in, in the boys in the playground, one of the things I did wonder about was, I mean, nobody likes boys fighting, but back in the old days, adults would either look the other way or they would go out and say, you know, boys, break it up, break it up, cool down, you know. Now, today, the police are called children under 10 sometimes end up with a criminal record for violence. So I, 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 there's a part of me that's wondering, have we misaligned our response to this behavior based on social expectations? rather than acknowledging what's really kind of a natural phase in childhood development. Right, and I, I worry, I mean, society has changed in, uh, for the better, I, I believe, right? Yeah. Radically yeah. so. And at the same time, the, the, the real threats that exist are, 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 are still there. There, you know, the, the level of violence is 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 less than it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, thousands of years ago. Our society is less violent than it was in the past, but violence is still there. And 
the question is, if you, or one thing to, to think about, and I don't know the answer, is if we, through socialization, remove to the greatest extent possible the impulse, the emotions, or the response to those, we're not going to change the emotions, but the response to those emotions, if we change the response of, to the emotions of fear and anger and hate, where we actually lose the response of actually coming to blows, um, are we endangering ourselves, right? You know, the, the recent events in Ukraine, it just completely took me by surprise, but it's happening, it's horrible. And um, it's, it was, from my perspective, unexpected. So at some level, I, I worry that we, we can't completely extinguish our ability to respond with, with what is uh, a sensible level of, of, of violence. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit in my questions, but, you know, one of the things I'd wondered as well is these same drives, right, that, that, that drive us towards conflict are also some of the similar drives to what drives us towards achievement, right, and drives, I, I mean, you know, so you could see boys fighting on the playground over girls, right, which they've been doing for, you know, as long as humans have been humans. But but then do do that too, the, it turns out. But yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, those those are are possibly related to the same drives that are propelling us to the moon and the stars and beyond. And you know, and, and so then you have to wonder, you know, is is this aggression, you know, is there is there kind of an upside? And and if so, maybe maybe the challenge is identifying the triggers. And this is what I think you were alluding to with Ukraine. Um, you know, in any conflict, instead of trying to change the fundamental human nature, which could be very dangerous, maybe we could identify those triggers and provide better pathways for, for emotional outlet, right? Like if we could identify where fear turns into anger and where anger turns into physical conflict, maybe we could provide people with better tools to short circuit that themselves you know, and unclench that fist, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, okay. So there's a couple of questions in there, I think. Um, the first thing I was thinking as you were talking was this this idea that, that if we extingu extinguish our capacity to be aggressive, do we lose an ability to confront challenges or to face challenging circumstances, yes. right? Yes. And I think I think the answer there is is probably we don't have to worry about it. Because I would say, and you've already said it, that, that this aspect, the dark side of human nature is part of who we are, but it's only part of it. It, 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 it is part of us, but it, it's not all of us, all of who, who we are, right? We do have this capacity to be, to be uh, helpful and empathetic, unselfish, right? To cooperate. And all those things are equally hard. It's just as hard to do those. Those things are just as challenging. And so, uh, I'm not worried that that we're going to lose our ability to achieve greatness by by extinguishing or or putting the uh, uh, turning down the volume on our our response to violence. So I think our work has been controversial because we have been through our experiments and our arguments, we've been suggesting that humans may be anatomically specialized for aggression. If we're anatomically specialized for aggression, it's a small step to the, to the more troubling notion that we may be behaviorally specialized to be aggressive, right? That yes. Parts of our brain uh, are prone to, to violent behavior. So people are scared of our research because it, it could be, they, they worry that it may be used to justify bad behavior, but they also worry that, that it suggests that it's, it, the dark side of human nature is, is who we are, that it defines us. And as we've said a couple of times now, yes, it does define us, but it, it's not all of, of who we are. And so um, 
we, Thomas Hobbes, the 16th century English philosopher, argued that there are three reasons why human males fight. They fight to defend resources, they fight to take resources, and they fight to protect the reputation. He, he used different words, but it, that was basically the three reasons. And it turns out he's right. That's true. And we can define, I think, with greater clarity what those resources that are being defended and, and taken really are. And it's it comes down to uh, to two things that one one of which is unique about humans, two things associated with our mating system. One is this male-male competition for access to mates. That's that's true across not all but most mammalian species, and uh, in humans, modern humans, thirty percent of the homicides in the United States can be associated with with jealousy. So. So that's part of it. But then but that's just the mammalian character state, right? That's we're not different in that regard. But what humans do do is we're unusual in that males contribute to the provisioning, protection, and rearing of, of their offspring. For most species of mammals, mom does all of that. She is she's out there by herself doing it entirely by herself. But in humans, males play a really important role. And so because of that. Human males invest their lifetime in their reproductive lifetime and output in a relatively small number of individuals. If you're going to invest in a, in a small number of individuals and spend your life doing that, then you need to be able to protect those individuals. And so the, the thing that really distinguishes humans from human males from other mammalian males is that we work together. We co we cooperate in coalitions to to protect our families and our communities. And so, um, with that understanding, we can we can start saying, well, you know, if we wanted to engineer society to be less violent, if we wanted to engineer the the international community to, so there was less war, what would we do? And there are things that we can do. Right, we can, we can um, uh, set up our systems so there's going to be less jealousy. We can set it up. It turns out income inequality is a big motivator in humans. Just the the relative position of where you are economically or socially on the hierarchy uh, provides motivation. If you're down at the bottom, you are, and, and you're a male in particular, you're in a situation that is, could very likely will negatively, negatively impact your reproductive success. Yeah. So, so I, I, there, there are things that we can do from that understanding to, to make the world a safer, more peaceful place. Well, you know, on that note, I can't think of a better place to, to close for today. And let me thank you so much for your time. And let me close by asking, you know, I mean, the, the war to end all wars happened over 100 years ago, and we're still fighting with each other. You know, Ukraine was actually the reason that I reached out to you, and I know that that troubles you as well. And you know, we, we have weapons of mass destruction capable of ending the world as we know it, and we're still fighting. We're just a little bit more careful about it. And so you know, one of the things that I, I wondered internally was, does conflict continue because we solve these intractable intractable disagreements by fighting. And and do you think that your work, some of the things that you've mentioned, as well as the research that you continue to do, do you think that could help us finally find a path to peace? I think understanding is going to help, right? If, if we, if we sh and I think we all do, we all share the goal of reducing violence, uh, making, making our societies safer places to live. Um, given that goal, we can get there faster if we understand who we are. Where, what's, if we understand what's motivating the, our, the extent to which we can quickly respond with fear, quick, quickly respond and, and sort of unravel into hate of other, of other individuals and other groups. If we understand 
what's behind those emotions, we can take steps to, to make the world a safer place. So I, I think the answer is yes. And I, I, I want to I throw out one more point uh, that I think is really important. And that is because, again, we see it right now. We see, we see the extent to which fear of other individuals can be used to motivate a population, motivate individuals, right? Are humans, no, humans, no, humans reached a point where the, the main danger was not tigers and lions. The main danger was actually other humans, right? Once we got to that point, then it makes sense to have a strong response, a strong capacity to be wary of other groups of and uh, other groups of humans and other individuals. But what we have to keep in mind is that we live right now in one of the safest places on the planet and undoubtedly the safest time in our evolutionary history. So yes, there are reasons to be worried about others. There's reasons to be fearful, but at the same time, this is the safest time and place. We've got to keep that in mind. We're making progress. The world is becoming, society is becoming more peaceful and safer. Yeah, it, it reminds me of Kennedy's final analysis quote. You know, I mean, we, we have more in common than separates us. And I, I think as, as long as we all continue working, you know, in, and with the research that you're doing as well, understanding ourselves better, I think that that can eventually bring us together and help us overcome, you know, these, these drives that we get from our ancestors. So, and I would say it is, and it will. Yes, I agree. Wonderful. David, thank you again, sir. Thank you very much.